In today's video I would like to show you an old book. I purchased this in a used bookstore in Dayton, Ohio, I believe, in the mid-1980s. It is, I think you can make it out just barely if you look at the spine. It says, The Catholic Church. And then down here it says, History and Defense of Our Religion. It was published in 1920. My copy is uh, pretty beat up. The boards are soggy. The uh, binding is loose. I've had to use some tape to hold it together in various places. The Pope, at the time it was published, was Benedict the Fifteenth, and here he is. It's the way they posed for photographs back in those days. The fourth apostolic delegate to the United States was the Most Reverend Giovanni Bonzano. We have a page of onion skin paper and then the title page. History and Defense of Our Religion, the Catholic Instructor. Sumptuously illustrated, this is the Office of Catholic Publications, 1920. has an imprimi potest, let it be printed. And then we have the contents. You'll notice that the contents begin on page 149. There's also an oddity that I'll show you. It begins with the fundamentals of the Catholic faith. There's material before page 149. We'll take a look at some of that. History of the religion, defense of the teachings, answers to popular delusions. Explanation of Ceremonies, St. Rita of Cassia, Seven Sacraments, Sacerdotal Vestments, and Sacred Vessels, Sacramentals, Readings for each Sunday in the year, The Catholic Mother to Her Children by the Countess de Lavigny. Uh, great utterances by Cardinal Gibbons. This has to do, this is rather patriotic for the United States of America. And His Eminence, Cardinal James Cardinal Gibbons. So it does have illustrations. This man is His Eminence William Cardinal O'Connell, the Archbishop of Boston. And then we come to John Cardinal Farley. It's a nice pose. A bit on heroic labors of priests and sisters in World War I. A stray shot, an innocent victim on a battlefield of France. Cardinal Mercier, Archbishop of Malines, Belgium. I'm sure I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Here's a priest on the firing line with the Belgian army. I've never studied French, so I'm sure I mispronounce French horribly. Priests hold services in a cave in Soissons, Belgium. And blessing the graves of soldiers. Then the great sacrifice. We have, uh, I believe this was an encyclical letter, Pope Benedict XV on the peace of the world. I want to draw your attention to two points in the encyclical. One here is on this page on the left. We desire also that our people should refrain from the use of those appellations, um, appellatives which have recently been introduced to distinguish Catholics from Catholics. And uh, there is no need, therefore, to add epithets to the profession of Catholicism. I wonder if anybody among the view viewing audience knows what he's referring to here, what kind of 
appellatives were being used in that time frame. And secondly, on the page to the right, we can see some strong words against modernism. Um, our predecessor rightly termed modernism the synthesis of all heresies. Um, this condemnation uh, we renew in a full extent and since the contagion, which is so pestiferous, has uh, not been entirely removed, it creeps about here and there secretly. Uh, we desire that Catholics should not only keep clear of the errors, but also the tendency of what is called the spirit of the modernists. Um, the spirit rejects disdainfully whatever savors of antiquity, but he really searches for novelties everywhere in the manner of speaking of divine things, and the celebration of divine worship in the Catholic institutions and in the private exercise of piety. Toward the end of the encyclical, he says, the sovereign pontiff has been deprived of the protection which by the will of divine providence he obtained in the course of ages to safeguard that liberty. I think that may be referring to the papal states. Uh, it causes serious anxiety. Um, the Catholics demand their common father should really be free in the exercise of his apostolic ministry. So we wish that peace be restored. This was obviously written during World War I. Uh, we also desire that the ab abnormal condition in which the head of the church finds himself is highly injurious to the peace of people should cease. We renew on the same ground the protests on the subject which our predecessors made on several occasions. Here's a general view of the Vatican Gardens. And if you're hearing a curious noise in the background, that's just my cat bathing herself. Here's the choir of the Sixteen Chapel. And on the next page we have a view of the uniforms of the household troops of the Pope. It's followed by the defense of the church. And this is basically quotations from non-Catholics, where they say nice things about the Catholic Church. And this goes on for several pages. And it ends on page 66 over here on the left, then we come to Catholic questions, historical and controversial. Catholic's defense of his faith, faith in the form of questions and answers, um, defense of the Catholic faith and doctrine, and we notice the next page number is 150. So we did skip some pages. I'm not sure whether there was an, an originally intended another section here, or whether just different material that had been enumerated differently was collected together to make this book. One of the questions I thought was curious is this one, can you prove that Christ's church upon earth is always visible? And the answer quotes various scriptures. But um, I wonder why there is such a question, because the laity are human beings, and human beings aren't visible, and they're certainly part of the church, so their existence alone, it seems to me, would make the church visible. We also find arguments like this one, uh, that the Catholic Church alone is the true Church of Christ, and it proves it by demonstrating that the Protestant sects have only come into the world since the year 1500, but the argument only has force if you believe that the Protestant sects are, in fact, essentially not part of the original Church, that the changes that they introduced were essential so that they change the identity of the church. This is interesting. Under scripture and tradition, the question, what is it necessary to believe concerning the scripture? The answer is that it is to be received as the infallible word of God. And yet these days, particularly in study Bibles, you find remarks that indicate that only Protestant fundamentalists would hold that position. This uh, paragraph answers the question, why the Mass is said in Latin. It's kind of interesting reading it these days when the Latin Mass has been abrogated to a large extent because it's the ancient language of the Church for greater uniformity 
to avoid changes which all vulgar languages are daily exposed to because the math is being a sacrifice um, it's enough that they be in a language which the priest understands and it's not injurious to the people who are instructed to accompany the priest in every part of the sacrifice by prayers on page 187 we see the question how do you prove that this commission given to Peter descends to the Pope or Bishop of Rome the answer is because by the unanimous consent of the fathers and, and the tradition of the church in all ages the bishops of Rome are the successors of St. Peter under why Catholics object to Protestant religion that's on page 188 it says because the Protestant religion is a new religion there's a section on hard questions to answer and then a short history of religion which goes back to the Old Testament time section 2 is Moses to Christ it has questions for the young at the bottoms of the pages history of Christ history after Christ the triumph of the church over paganism through the Roman Empire and the conversion of Constantine to the rise of Protestantism church triumphing over the barbarians the crusades heresies and then from the rise of Protestantism in the 16th century to the present efforts of the church in favor of peace religious orders and congregations the French Revolution the influence of the French Revolution concluding remarks and a chronological succession of the popes starting with Peter Peter, Linus, Cletus, Clement Evaristus, Alexander I Sixtus I Telesphorus and on and on ending with Benedict the 15th in 1914 it would be interesting to compare this in detail with more modern listings it's a drawing of the Holy Family the Madonna of the Rosary the vision of Saint Teresa Teresa St. Patrick going to Tara St. Bridget it says the Mary of Ireland St. Agnes with a lamb St. Rose of Lima and St. Clare Popular objections against Catholic faith and devotion answered by a convert. So this is uh, more Catholic answers circa 1920. And the reasonableness of doctrines alleged uncharitableness alleged laxity in morals and we come to popular delusions respecting Catholic faith and devotion devotions also answered by a convert in this popular delusions section there's one section four on the scriptures which talks about the unfounded prejudice is uh, that Catholics discourage if they do not prohibit the reading of scripture so they begin by saying first the church un undoubtedly prohibits the reading of the Protestant versions of holy scriptures of course that's no longer true the second point is that, that the church discourages the indiscriminate circulation Of even the true scriptures without note or comment note how the Protestant versions are the false scriptures uh, the, the uh, 
indiscriminate circulation among those who, from their want of education or from other circumstances, are not in a position to make a good use of them. Section 9 is on liberty of thought, and they point out here that, in fact, the Catholics only have no liberty where the Church has declared something. Um, it preserves us from that slavery to human opinion, they say, so it's a good thing to be compelled to agree with the Church wherever it has defined something. But outside the Church's definitions and interpretations, we are bound to no unity of thought or opinion. On such matters, Catholics may and do often differ. Then there are two more illustrations. This is St. Catherine of Siena. And on the reverse, we have the Adoret offering Mass in the cell of the Anchorite Maries in the 5th century. Ceremonies of the Mass. And so this is an explanation of what goes on in the Mass. At one time, someone who owned it made pen, pencil changes to it. Uh, this was long before I owned it. From the canon to the end. So this explains what happened in the old Latin Mass prior to 1969-1970 time frame. So the Reverend James P. O'Brien, rector of St. Rita's Church. Notice the toothless collar. St. Rita of Cassia. And then a bit about her. And the seven sacraments. Baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, holy orders, marriage. And some interesting thing here about the uh, the vestments and sacred vessels. So they have them here and they're defined in this section. You can see the words in bold, the cope, the stole, the maniple, but no illustrations. But then when we come to another section in a moment, we see illustrations. So here's the maniple on the left, the mitre on the right, the fish hat, the chasuble, a surplus, a dalmatic, we have a cope, and a stole, an alb, and a stole, the bishop's oil stocks used in confirmation and ordination, and a confessional. Chrismeal, chrismali, for holding holy chrism. A censer. Cruets. Holy water part. Oh, I'm sorry, holy water pot and sprinkle. The baptismal font. Quite interesting one. Oil stocks. A veil, a coffin covered with a pall, a triangle with candles used in the Tenabri and Holy Week, an altar as prescribed by the ceremonial. So it has the six candles that were required in the olden days, I suppose. A priest putting on the cincture or the girdle over the alb. priest putting on the amos, a ciborium, chalice and paten, illustration of a station of the cross, and conferring of the pallium on an archbishop, an archiepiscopal cross, and a crozier, and a monstrance, Paschal candlestick, and more things, a pyxis, large and small hosts, a 
clapper for Holy Week, and bread irons. Something here on the rosary, scapular, crucifixes, medals, and crosses, and then beautiful stories and short readings for Sundays and Holy Days. More illustrations here. This is the 26th lesson in that same section, the Holy Rosary. And a Christian mother's child from earth to heaven. So here's a poem. Christian's mother's child from earth to heaven illustrated on the right. The reward of the Christian father on the left. And the reward of the Christian father illustrated on the right. The reward of the Christian mother on the left. And the reward of the Christian mother illustrated on the right. And finally we have St. Walburga. This is an illustration of the unveiling of the Columbus Memorial in Washington, D.C. on the 8th of June, 1912. And of course, tomorrow is Columbus Day in the United States, or Indigenous Peoples Day. This is a Sunal statue of Christopher Columbus, designed for Central Park. Don't know if it ever was placed there. Here is the first mass in the New World, illustrated. And bearing the cross to the New World, the landing of Columbus. Let's see if I can give you a better look at that. There's a section on the Knights of Columbus and their growth and progress. Columbus Memorial. And then an encyclopedic dictionary with all sorts of terms defined, um, but the pronunciation is not given. Mine came with this little inset here. National Shrine of St. Jude, St. Jude's Oil and a prayer on the back. This is where it was when I acquired the book, so I just left it there. Let's see, I just saw a definition of Lutheranism. Let's see what it says. Lutherans, followers of Luther, whose most distinctive tenet was justification by faith only, without good works. The Catholic faith on this point was fully defined at the Council of Trent. And so we come to the end. And someone wrote some notes. I'm not sure for what purpose. I've not actually ever deciphered them here. But I think they're sort of like a to-do list. Things that need to be done. At the back. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that brief look through this 102-year-old book. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to like if you did like. And you're always welcome to hit the subscribe button. Thank you again.